Okay, so Ode to the West Wind. Ode to the West Wind is an absolutely glorious poem. Um, it is one that is so rich with really beautiful imagery, really enjoyable imagery, um, but one that also is incredibly political and incredibly personal. So any of you who are looking at that um, that duality, you're gonna really, um, you're gonna find this a really useful one to bring in. And indeed, I think you'll find Percy Shelley a really interesting poet uh, to consider on, on that kind of line. This is definitely a poem that is not always immediately obvious what's going on. Um, we can kind of take it as, oh, what a pretty nature poem. Um, although not pretty, because straight away we can see there are ghosts, there are enchanters, there's hectic red, there's pestilence. It's, it's a pretty aggressive nature poem. And a lot of Percy Shelley's writings about nature are of a powerful, um, vicious kind of just energy that destroys and often in a very heartless way it's not all oh, pretty little birds singing it is well actually sometimes it is he does like his nightingales um but then he does also do these uh mountains he does you know glaciers tearing up landscapes um and the wild west wind i mean the west wind isn't a nice sweet fluttering breath that uh you know it's not a nice breeze this is powerful this is something that can change things and change is a really important function of this so let's look at it through um do you get this get this poem up uh either if you've got it on your on your screens but if you have a paper copy do take that and make some notes as you're kind of going through you will see we have as well as the individual stanzas we have five distinct sections now the the format here is quite interesting in that we, we start with an invocation. Oh, wild west wind. We often call this an apostrophe in poetry. Not like the little thing about the S, but a, a, an apostrophe is an address to someone or something who either isn't physically there or cannot hear you. So an apostrophe is, um, oh, oh, Romeo, oh, Romeo, where are four out there, Romeo? She is not believing Romeo is there. She does not believe that Romeo is going to answer. Um, an apostrophe could also be, oh, coffee, how I love you, um, because coffee isn't listening um so all oh, wild west wind this is the poet's evocation to the wind the next three sections not the stanzas but the actual sections are all talking uh about the west wind it's basically just describing the west wind and it's not till section four that he actually says what he wants to say to the wind he says oh wind here's all the things you are here's all the things you are here's all the things you are Right, here's my point. <laughs> so it takes us a while to get to it. Um, so it can actually, you know, bear that in mind as we look through the first three sections, that it's the fourth and fifth section where he really kind of delivers his punch, which is not to mean that the beginning isn't relevant because it is, because it's setting up what he represents, what, what the wind represents to him. So we start um, with this, uh, this, this lo lovely poetry, uh, the breath of autumn's being. So we're going autumnal right at the beginning. We're not looking at spring. We're looking at a time of decay, a time of endings. Um, thou from whose presence the leaves dead are driven like ghosts from an enchanter fleeing, yellow, black and pale and hectic red, the pestilence stricken multitudes. Okay, so first of all, he's just describing dead leaves that are flying on the wind. Um, but he describes them as multitudes, and this is a word that often gets used for people, for a great crowd. These are the multitudes, the masses. Um, the way that we would often say the masses now, the multitudes was a word sort of very commonly used, um, used at the time. Uh, so he's just starting to link these vast amounts of leaves to a vast amount of people who are just being tossed around by the wind. Um, and th this poem becomes political, and we, we can see by the end of it that he does have a, a very strong political intent um, that's not necessarily obvious on a first read through. So he, he goes on, so the O oh Thou, so again, he's just addressing the wind, you whose chariotists to their dark wintry bed are the winged scenes. Uh, again, very sort of thick levels of, of, of imagery of description. Um, 
literally just you are carrying seeds, winged seeds, if you think of like sycamore seeds or something like that, um, you're just carrying the seeds to their wintry bed, to where they're going to lie for winter. Uh, where they lie cold and low, each like a corpse within its grave, until thine as your sister of the spring shall blow. So the wind's job is to take the seeds and bury them. It is, it is a mourning process, it is a grieving process, it is a sad process. What it has to do deals entirely with death. But it is a, we're not talking just the end point because spring will come. Um, the final line of this poem, which you may well have heard uh, quoted out of context, if winter comes, can spring be far behind? Um, which is the kind of thing you might get written on a notebook in paper chase. <laughs> I mean, this too will pass. Uh, but, you know, incredibly true and incredibly important to what Shelley's saying, because he is talking about strife and difficulty. He is talking about the pain of what the autumn wind must do. But just acknowledging every now and then going, yep, yeah, to lead us through to spring. Spring will eventually come. Um, so spring blows the clarion over the dreaming earth and fills driving sweet buds like flocks to feed the air with living hues and odours plain and hill wild spirit which art moving everywhere destroyer and preserver here oh here so this is the end of that first section he's addressed this wind he said what it does he said what it does and then he says oh here listen to me um so he's still basically just addressing the wind and then we get another stand another section um of basically the same thou on whose stream again he's describing you who does this you who does this um we kind of uh, uh this is this is lovely the angels of rain and lightning i, th I love that that image um they're spread on the bright surface of thine every surge like bright hair uplifted from the head of some fierce minute even from the dim verge of horizons to the zenith's heights the locks of the approaching storm thou dirge of the dying year so this is this is all kind of building this very wonderful gothic um storms and angels of lightning um percy shelley's a very gothic poet um those of those of you who did the gothic course with me will know that i i often dispute the line between gothic and romantic and i think there's a great deal of crossover and an awful lot of people end up in one category because they're poets or, or novelists and and don't necessarily cross over but if you look at something like frankenstein which percy shelley very heavily edited uh, you know, v very significantly it was certainly the first draft and you know the, this story is very much Mary Shelley's but he does a lot of the kind of the fine tuning and he puts in a lot of the more gothic elements actually um so sorry coming back to this so the second section again it's just building up atmosphere of the wind and again it ends with oh here so we've got we're starting with wind you do this listen to me wind here you are listen to me with wind you do this listen to me um, so the, the third one, again, I'm not going to go into too much detail on, but now we're kind of contrasting the um, the storms and the, the, the angels of lightning with the wakening the Mediterranean from summer dreams. So, oh yes, wasn't the Mediterranean lovely and peaceful in the sunshine? Okay, well, autumn wind kind of has to come along and, and shake it and wake it. Um, which waking, the idea of waking, is it's kind of linked to that idea of the painted veil that we're, we're kind of sleeping somehow. We're sleeping in our happiness and our contentedness. We, we don't look at the way things are and will be very useful um, when we look at the next poem, The Mask of Anarchy, where he says, rise like lions after slumber. Um, so saying you've been asleep, but now is the time to wake up and charge. Essentially, we're coming on to that one. It is so good, so good. Most quotable poem that I know. Anyway, um, now let's look at the fourth section. So he's, he finishes the third section with, oh, here again. And this is kind of the, the final one as we move on to the fourth section. And he steps forward to speak in his own, his own voice. Well, the, the speaker's voice. If I were a dead leaf, thou might spare. If I were a swift cloud to fly with thee, a wave to pant beneath thy power and share the impulse of thy strength, only less free than thou, oh, uncontrollable. If even I were as in my boyhood and could be the comrade of thy wanderings over heaven, then when to outstrip thy sky speed scarce seemed a vision. Ne'er have I would ne'er have striven as thus with thee in prayer in my sore need. Oh, lift me as a wave, a leaf, a cloud. All right, I'm going to pause there. So he's kind of saying, if I could be carried on the wind. So he sort of says, well, what if I was a, a leaf or a cloud or just anything that could be carried 
could just be swept along on the wind, not as in control as the wind is, um, no, in no way able to guide the wind, just being taken by the wind and distributed somewhere um, in the way that seeds are. And he also links to his childhood, which, you know, I think we've mentioned at various times this idea of uh, an idyllic innocence in childhood often comes up in the romantic poets, particularly Blake, um, but Wordsworth as well, very much so. Um, all of them, actually. They all do. <laughs> um, he says, even, you know, even in my childhood, I was closer to being swept by the wind than I am now. Um, and if he was any of these things, he wouldn't have had to pray. He wouldn't have had to pray to the wind now, which, which he is doing. And he asks to be lifted. He asks to be picked up by the wind and swept away, um, which seems a very kind of desperate thing. And, and he gets a little bit dramatic on this, li this line. Uh, Lift me as a wave, a leaf, a cloud. I fall upon the thorns of life. I bleed. Um, it's very hard not to mock him at this point. There are a few moments when dear Percy Bysshe is a bit like, no one understands me. And we love him very much and he does wonderful things, but occasionally he's a little bit whiny. Um, the heavy weight of ours has chained and bowed one too like thee, tameless, swift and proud. So he compares himself to the wind there. He says he is tameless, he is swift, he is proud. He is all these things that the wind is, but he has been borne down by the chains of life, um, the heavy weight of ours. Um, so the hours that he has had to live through have, uh, have essentially treated him badly and now his spirit is somewhat broken and he wants to be picked up and swept away, which at this point, we might be thinking that this is a a kind of a, oh, I don't want to do anything anymore, just be over with it. That it's almost a kind of a, an almost suicidal, just stop, I don't want this anymore. But it's not, because it is not the lying low of winter. The seeds being buried for winter isn't the end of their story. Coming on to the fifth. Fifth, fifth section here, make me thy lyre, even as the forest is. Okay, this comes back to the idea of the lyre, which I talked about before with the painted veil, and which you've got a couple of pictures of the on the slides of there, um, to say, you know, just make me your instrument, Leo. I, I will be, um, there's a word that escapes me right now, <laughs> that essentially the wind can just use him to say what it needs to say. Um, even as the forest is, so the wind flows through the forest, it makes, it makes noise, it is uh, swept around as, as the wind wishes. What if my leaves are falling like its own? So an acknowledgement that he's kind of getting older, that things are changing. The tumult of thy mighty harmonies will take from both a deep autumnal tone, sweet though in sadness. Be thou spirit fierce, my spirit. Be thou me, impetuous one. This wonderful idea of just, yes, you take me, you be me, just I will do whatever you want to. And then, I love this, drive my dead thoughts over the universe like withered leaves to quicken a new birth. Just gorgeous. Okay, so the dead thoughts. What are the dead thoughts here? So, in a way, they're being, they're being characterised as the leaves that are being swept across the world. Um, so, of course, the universe here, he's taking it wider. I don't think the wind can go anywhere other than Earth, but may maybe he knows something, I don't know. Um, but dead thoughts, this is a poet, and, and sorry, something I probably should have said before, quite unlike Byron, even unlike Wordsworth and, and, and you know, Coleridge to an extent, he, Shelley didn't have readership. Shelley was one of the least widely read poets of the Romantics, I think, I, in, in his own lifetime. Um, and he minded. <laughs> he often said, oh, no, no, I don't mind, you know, future generations might understand me, you know, uh, you know, I'm not writing for the people. But he massively did, and he often went through phases of trying to find um, a format that would suit, a format that, uh, that would communicate with the people, uh, you know, to find a way of speaking that would resonate with people. Um, a lot of his works are extremely esoteric, and one of his great, great sort of uh, magnum opus is, is probably Prometheus Unbound, uh, which if you get super into Shelley, go and read Prometheus Unbound. It's basically a novel in poetry. <laughs> uh, it's a lyrical drama. It is absolutely stunning. It's like, give it a summer, you know. <laughs> um, but it's not accessible. <laughs> like, here are all of his great ideas, all of his you know, beautiful writing. Um, but 
people aren't reading it because my goodness you need a whole summer and you need to be an English student to, to get any progress with it so he felt very sad that his ideas weren't being communicated particularly because he felt very you know he, he had this moral vision and he felt that the world wasn't in a good place and that he had ideas of how it could be better and that he was writing them and shaping them and no one was listening and nothing was ever going to change um, and so what he's asking here is these dead thoughts his thoughts are dead they are written down and no one is reading them no one is listening to them so what he says is well if the wind takes them spreads them across the universe like the leaves the seeds they will just be buried in the ground they will stay dead for a while and until at last they will start to grow scatter as from an unextinguished hearth ashes and sparks my words among mankind like a fire, you know, spread, sparks spread on the wind, they will sooner or later take flame. And it's interesting that he brings in fire there because fire is not a peaceful image. You know, the, the leaves, okay, that's quite, that's quite calm, that's quite peaceful. Um, even if we've sort of felt it's been quite a violent poem so far with some pretty dark images, um, bringing in fire starts to say, okay, maybe this isn't gonna be easy. Maybe when people do start to listen, it's gonna lead to some kind of violence people are going to say okay we can't just take this setting down we're going to have to fight a bit and we really see a call to arms in the, in the next poem um be through my lips to unawakened earth the trumpet of a prophecy oh wind if winter comes can spring be far behind um, so it is a moment of darkness a moment of I don't want to say pessimism because it is not, because it, it, it is a pessimistic mindset that is trying desperately to look for optimism, is, is my personal kind of feeling on it. Uh, we can say, no, it is optimism in the darkness. It is the darkest moment in which she says, everything is bad, nothing is working, no one is reading my works, I don't know, I don't know where to go, I need the wind to come, invigorate, take these words, spread them across the universe, spread the message of truth. Um, and one day, they will work. One day these words will be read and they will start to grow. Um, and as we're going to see with um, the next poem, Mask of Anarchy, Percy Shelley is probably one of the poets who has been most quoted in, uh, in, in political action. Uh, okay, yes, Mask of Anarchy, coming right up.